Welcome to Equipping Hour. You can find your seat, come on in and find a place to be. And I'll begin us with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to gather with your people once again, uh, to be here on a Sunday morning, a, a weekly commemoration of an empty tomb. Uh, we thank you for the privilege of gathering. Uh, we thank you for the privilege of sitting under your word. Uh, we thank you for the great privilege it is to join our voices together and our hearts together in and under truth. We pray that we would proclaim uh, not only what is true from your word to one another in mutual encouragement, uh, but all the hope and life and joy and confidence that goes with it. And we ask it in your name. Amen. Uh, the title of this week's Equipping Hour, this Lord willing, will be this week and next week, a uh, two-part series called Evangelism 101. And uh, when you go to college, you take a class, 101 means kind of like the basics, the beginning. And um, I, I hope this the thought of two weeks on evangelism is not intimidating. I hope it has the, hey, Jen Herbranson, it's really good to see you. I refrain, when, when I see you and Nate come in in the main service on a Sunday morning, I see you and I refrain from calling you out. But equipping hour is different. Glad you're here. <laughs> I hope that two weeks of evangelism discussion is not intimidating in the sense of thinking you need to become an expert before you ever open your mouth. In fact, what I hope to do over the course of these two weeks together um, is encourage you simply to open your mouth with the gospel. Uh, we'll talk about a number of different methods and strategies and the theology underneath and behind evangelism. And yet I would love for you to lose yourself in the joy of telling people about your Savior. Every day you walk on the earth until you go home. So uh, don't look at two weeks of lecture on evangelism as all the secret expert advice you're going to need to do it just right. I want to encourage you to just do it. So that's my hope. Uh, if, if that fails, just let me know. Say, Smed, you're doing it wrong. We need to be encouraged. Um, and we've got two weeks to sort of walk through this. So there's an outline uh, up at the top that will sort of give you the six points we're going to be working through this week and next week. Reasons for evangelism, methods of evangelism, platforms for evangelism, the content of evangelism, the theology of evangelism, and an example of evangelism. That's sort of a roadmap of where we're going this week and next. Um, let's just start with the reasons for evangelism. And I'll give you two this morning. Uh, the ought to and the want to. Okay, there's an ought to in evangelism. We should do evangelism. And then there's a want to. And I think these things worked hand in hand to motivate us to tell other people about Christ. Uh, let's start with the ought to. A familiar text, Matthew 28. The Great Commission, you know there are 11 men on the top of a mountain with Jesus here as he is departing the earth. And he gives them this task. Make disciples of all the nations, going, baptizing, teaching. And this task of making disciples is given to disciples. The implication is that disciples would make disciples who make disciples who make disciples to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the age. This is a task not for the specialists, but for the disciples of Jesus, the followers, the learners of Jesus. If you are a genuine Christian, you are by definition a learner, a follower of Jesus, and this is our task. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Jesus makes this promise in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts sort of unfolds along that scheme. Now, Jerusalem is where the gospel expansion began into the regions of Judea to Samaria and the regions beyond. Psalm 105 is a, a wonderful expression in song that has sort of a command flavor to it, 
about how we think about praising God for what He's done. Look at Psalm 105, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, the psalmist sings. Call upon His name. Make known His acts among the peoples. Plural. Interesting. This is Israel's songbook. And the command is that God's people would call on God, they would sing to Him, and they would tell the world how great God is. Look at Proverbs 11, verse 30. This in the wisdom literature tells us one of the wise things we ought to be about. Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. Recognize that man's fundamental problem is an internal problem, and the winning of souls, or the winning of the inner man unto godliness, is actually a mark of wisdom in life. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 8. And I say to you, Jesus says, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. And then the converse is also true if you don't confess me before men. If you're afraid to talk about me before men, uh, I will not confess you before my Father. Colossians 4 will be the last ought we'll look at this morning. Beginning in verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 4, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that is for Paul and his associates, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak the mystery of Christ for which I also have been bound. Colossians are encouraged here to pray for Paul in his evangelistic efforts. That I might make it manifest in the way I ought to speak. And then notice verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, redeeming the time. Let your words always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should answer each person. So on the heels of Paul praying for open doors and boldness in his own speech in the evangelistic efforts, he encourages the Colossian believers to think the same way about themselves. Think about your relationships with outsiders, uh, seasoned with grace, Uh, with wisdom, redeeming the time. Those are the oughts. Those are some reasons to do evangelism from what does it mean to walk wisely? Uh, What does it mean to obey uh, the commands of Scripture? And then what does it mean fundamentally just to be a learner or a disciple of Christ in this great commission, long chain of learners who go about and make new learners who make new learners, disciple-making, disciple-making disciples till the end of the age. So, first reason to do evangelism is because we should. The second reason to do evangelism is because we want to. There is a want to involved in salvation. In 1979, a British man named Nick Ward was 24 years old, and he got into a sailing race. And and these were sailing yachts, about 150 boats, that were going to sail around the Celtic Sea. And Uh, try to win a a race. Uh, These are small racing yachts with crews of anywhere from six to about 12 people. And they found themselves in the midst of what has become known meteorologically as a bomb cyclone. It was one of the worst weather events in recorded history, a severe low pressure system that brought down upper atmospheric air in a swirling tempest of hurricane force winds and 40 to 70 foot waves coming from all directions. It made a mess of this boat race. On Nick's boat, two of his crewmates died. And in the race itself, out of a nearly 150 boats that were racing, only 28 finished the race. Most were abandoned or were sunk. Fifteen sailors died in the storm. 
Nick found himself alone on the racing yacht with the mast snapped in half, the boat upside down. The entire crew had been tossed out of the boat so many times but held on by their safety harnesses. Eventually, Nick was left for dead alone on the boat. The, the rest of the crew that managed to get away got in the life raft. They saw him unconscious and assumed he was dead. In and out of consciousness, severely hypothermic, at one point Nick woke up, his body being banged against the hull of the ship. And he realized, I'm still here. Crawled back into the cockpit of the, of the racing boat. The, it was half sunken, the mast snapped off, and everything was broken to pieces. There were two men who were very personally involved in his rescue. One was on a much bigger boat, a little farther away, that saw his vessel in trouble and radioed for help. And then it was a man named Peter who descended for his first ever sea rescue as part of the Scottish National Guard from a Sea King helicopter lowered on a rope in these swirling winds, attached himself to Nick's nearly lifeless body, hoisted him up into the helicopter, and off they flew to the hospital and recovery. He barely survived. To this day, Nick Ward still talks with these two rescuers, the man named Christian who saw him and got on the radio, and the man named Peter who descended in the storm to pick up his body. Not only does he talk to these two men down to this very day, he will talk about them to anyone who will listen. And wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be thrilled to talk about a guy named Christian who got on the radio and a guy named Peter who came down to get you in such a situation? Christian, your plight in the maelstrom of depravity was far worse than Nick Ward's plight in a racing storm. And your rescue was far more infinite a distance than was Nick's. And your rescuer, sinless, perfect, holy God, who took on flesh to rescue Here's the great big want to of evangelism. Don't you want to tell everybody what happened to you? Don't you want to tell everybody how great your Savior is? Shouldn't He be your boast and your song and the topic of conversation with anyone who will listen? Hey, can I tell you what happened to me? Can I tell you about my Savior? And maybe a little distance between when you got saved and the humdrum, mundane, road mechanism of your normal everyday life has let you forget that. The, the impact of what it meant to have been hopeless and helpless and spiritually dead and to have been made alive by the grace of God. It's also possible we don't understand the depths of our salvation well enough. And so one of the great fuels for evangelism is actually knowing the gospel more deeply, more thoroughly, knowing who our God is, knowing who man is, knowing the great infinite chasm and the awful enmity caused by sin. To understand God's actual indictment of the human condition, to understand more deeply the, the depths of slavery to corruption, to, to, to go deep into the, the black backdrop of human depravity and then to go high into the brilliant glories of the gospel will help fuel our evangelism. The better you know the gospel, the, the better you're able to communicate it. And frankly, the more you want to. Evangelism, by the way, is the reason you're still on the earth. Others have said this well. If, if God's design for your life was to stop sinning now, you'd walk outside, get hit by a bus, you'd be in heaven, and you would sin no more. And that'd be great. That'd be wonderful. The reason you're still here on a cursed world, in a mixed condition, in a body that's breaking down, is so that you can be a trophy of God's grace, a learner of Jesus, and a disciple-making disciple. You will soon leave the world as dying, and you will go to your heavenly home. I think about Mark 5, you have the Gerasene demoniac, he's rescued from demonic oppression, and Jesus told him, go and, and tell your people what God has done for you. That's Mark 5, verse 19. It probably becomes the, the impetus for the great Gentile population in Mark 8 
that surrounds Jesus and the disciples when they feed the 4,000 in Gentile territory? Where did all these people come from that were interested in Jesus and his message? Probably the testimony of this man. Let me tell you what this Jesus guy did for me. I think about Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 42 says this, after the disciples were flogged, then they were rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Did they wake up every morning and they, did they read all the ought passages and said, oh, Lord, help me. I've got to do evangelism today. I've got to check off that box. They were just compelled. They were just driven. And it's understandable at some level to, to have witnessed Christ in his earthly ministry, to see him die, and then to physically eyewitness his resurrection. That would be a sort of experiential adrenaline that would drive these men for a little while. I think it's interesting that after the resurrection, Jesus didn't say, okay, now get out there with all of your adrenaline of your experience and go do it. But he said, wait. Actually commands them, don't do evangelism. Until Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit comes upon you in power and then you will be my witnesses. That's important. It means that our own personal desires aren't actually enough to do the task, though they ought to motivate us. Waking up and obeying the commands aren't enough to actually complete the Great Commission, though they ought to motivate us. We have to understand fundamentally that the great motivator of this task is Jesus himself. We, we've seen that recently in John chapter 10. He will go get his sheep. And we see that in Revelation chapter 5. The sheep whom he purchased with his own blood surround the throne of the Lamb and worship him forever. He'll complete this task. He's commissioned us to this task. What I want to do as we progress through this, most of our time this morning will be spent on methods of evangelism. And as you saw the outline, we're going to talk about the theology of evangelism, principles, and things we need to think about. And you might think this is a little bit backwards. Why would we talk about methods of evangelism before we understand the theology of it? And I'll give you my reasoning here. I want to put the methods in front of you this morning so that as I lay out 26 different ways to do evangelism, you're thinking of number 27, 28, 29, and 30. And between this week and next week, you can email me and text me and say, hey, I got another idea. Okay, so these are out front. Um, and I also want you to know that there's not a formula for how to do evangelism. There's not one way. Uh, there are many ways. Um, and I want to encourage you with some of these. Not everybody's the same. Not everybody's built the same way. Not everybody has the same gifting and personality and opportunity. Uh, and I want us to, to see a variety of different ways to do that. One of my goals in this series is that you will daily pray for opportunities. You wake up in the morning and you say, Lord, could it be today that you come back for me? And you say, Lord, who will you put in my path? that I can have a conversation with about Christ. Because eternity is coming like a freight train. And I can't wait for it. I long for your appearing, but that's bad news for people who don't know you. Lord, would you put somebody in my path? And I have found that when I pray for opportunities for evangelism, somehow, mysteriously, supernaturally, those opportunities show up. And, 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 and maybe that's the whole answer. Maybe God just answers prayer in, in a, in a super, um, supernatural way, intervening in human history to bring those opportunities to pass. Uh, no doubt he does that in answer to prayer. It also may be that if my heart is attuned to these things and I'm leaning on the Lord, um, pleading with him for opportunities, that he opens my eyes to opportunities that are regularly there. So I want to just encourage you, pray. Pray every morning. Who can I share the gospel with? And let me encourage you to start awkward conversations. Are you scared in potential evangelistic opportunities? I am. I get nervous. I start thinking, what are they going to think about me? If I, if, I had, if I say something about Jesus in this conversation, are they going to turn me off as some weirdo? Are they not going to be my friend anymore? 
Will I step on toes and offend and break relationships? What's gonna happen? I don't know. But usually what I discover, and, and there are times where I'm just awkward and then people don't talk to me anymore, that's fine. But usually what happens, I awkwardly start a conversation and then we just start talking about the gospel. That's not awkward anymore. I find the hardest part is the starting. So I wanna encourage you, pray in the morning for opportunities and start awkward conversations. Jump into it. I wanna encourage you as well to plan to do things evangelistically and be ready for God's interruptions. Plan and unplan. So let's talk about some methods of evangelism. I don't have these up all on the screen. Um, we'd have to have a microfish reader uh, to get through all of that. So some of these are things that I've done. Um, and then some of these are things that I've heard of, seen other people do. Um, some are better than others. Um, just at the front end of this list, I'm not truly commending any of these to you as the thing you must do. Just a variety. Uh, I've done street evangelism. Street evangelism is, uh, you know, walking around uh, the street and bumping into somebody, trying to get somebody's attention and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you. Oh, really? About what? Are you selling me something? And trying to find a way to get into a gospel conversation. Uh, I've, I've done that in America. I've done that in other countries. I've done that through translators. I've done that with attention-getting tactics. And I've done that with just um, maybe cultural rudeness. <laughs> start a conversation with somebody who doesn't want to start a conversation. And sometimes you have something you can hand out. Sometimes it's just talk to whoever's willing. I've done open air preaching. That's a little bit different than just street evangelism. Open air preaching is I've prepared a message. I'm going to stand up on an elevated platform and I'm just going to start preaching my message. And it could bounce off of the walls. The pigeons will hear it and maybe passersby will pick up bits and pieces. Maybe you've seen the guys in Chandler with the megaphones at the intersections. You're like, here's something weird, man. Somebody's got their stereo up. You roll down your window and you hear, Jesus. <laughs> okay, I've done that one too. Um, people in our, our church have, have um, regularly shared the gospel on Mill Avenue. Uh, I've been a part of those. Maybe you've been down there sometimes. Uh, Mill Avenue is an interesting environment. Um, sometimes you get some sober people to talk to. So uh, that's an interesting opportunity. Um, First Fridays uh, was the sort of cultural arts, music, festival, fair thing. Uh, First Friday of the month in downtown Phoenix. Uh, we've used those as opportunities to walk around and talk to people about the gospel. When I was a college student in Chicago, we did subway preaching. So when the elevated train in Chicago went underground, they still called it the L, but it was a subway. And there were a few minutes between groups of people that would stand on the platform waiting for the next train. And so me and a few uh, college students would go down there with a hacky sack or a guitar or something to juggle, um, just try to get people's attention. And, and hey, I want to talk to you. Everybody's going, what's going on here? And did you know that you're a sinner? And did you know if you tried to get to heaven on your own merit, and you just, you're in, you're just, you got a captive audience, and you're never going to see these people again, because in five minutes, the subway will come up, doors will open, these people will get on, other people will get off, they'll be waiting for the next train, other people will filter down from the street and wait for the train, you got a new crowd about every 10 minutes. And do that for about three hours, and, oh, no, sorry, do that for about an hour, and, and you go through a number of rotations, and you can talk to two, three hundred people. I've done chairlift evangelism. Been at a ski resort. That's a captive audience. But it comes with a time stamp. Unless they jump off the chairlift, you've got about seven minutes. <laughs> How do I get in? How do I make the gospel clear? Um, you don't always finish a gospel conversation. Maybe you plant a seed. Uh, as, as one author on evangelism has put it, maybe you put a rock in their shoe that they're thinking about later. 
Maybe they talk to somebody else. Maybe you'll get on the lift with them again. I've exchanged phone numbers and had extended conversations after skiing with a few people. Maybe you've passed out tracks. Uh, those are you know, little slips of paper or pamphlets or cards that, that have the gospel contained in, in small form. Uh, one of my heroes in life, he's a, a pastor and a church planter in Geneva, Switzerland, was backpacking through India as a hippie, uh, was handed a gospel tract, read it, and got saved. Eventually <clears throat> went to seminary, became a pastor and a missionary. Uh, we have uh, GBC specific tracks available at the info table, both in English and in Spanish. You're welcome to stop by, grab a handful of those, uh, hand them to friends, use them to rehearse the gospel, talk to others, however you want to use those. I've known people that have left tracks in public places. Um, I have heard of someone who got saved picking up a tract in a public restroom. Um, I'm not sure that littering is the best strategy. Um, and if you leave a gospel tract in place of a tip at a restaurant, I might call that sin. Don't do that. Uh, but leaving tracts is, is, is a possible way to do that. Social media posts. Some of you use social media really well. Um, leave the other category aside for a moment. Um, but there are people who are effective evangelists um, through social media. Maybe you're in high school and you showed up, show up at a lunch table. And you start conversations there. Maybe you've got a group of friends that encourage each other. Uh, maybe you're talking Bible and there's people that listen in. What are you guys talking about? Uh, football? I, Jesus? Jesus and football? I don't know. And, and you sort of become known as the, the, the Christian groupies at school. Listen, there's a tremendous platform and an advantage to being publicly known as the guy with the answers about spiritual things. Don't be ashamed of that. Get together with your Christian buddies. Do that. Make plans. Start conversations. Maybe you go door to door in your own neighborhood. That one's a little bit scary, right? Door to door evangelism for me in a strange neighborhood is one thing. Knock on a door. Hi, uh, I'm from somewhere else, and I want to talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> But if it's your next door neighbor, hi, I'm your next door neighbor and I want to talk to you. <clears throat> Whoa, that's different. I have to live with the reputation not only of intruding with spiritual things into their lives, but, but now, now also um, we still have to see each other when we take out the trash. <laughs> they know how I live. They know whether I cut my grass at appropriate times. That's a, that's a different kind of evangelism. I'll never forget uh, being in, in Russia in 2001 and doing lots of evangelism all day, eight hours a day uh, or more, uh, nonstop evangelism. You know, the kind of evangelism you're just doing over and over and over again where you cut through all the introductories. You know, you start out, the, out at the beginning trying to find some common ground, build a bridge, how do I st start a conversation? And at the end you're like, I don't have time for all that. Hey, you want to talk about Jesus? <laughs> it just cut through it. And, and Janet and I came back to our apartment in the LA area, and we looked at all the, the doors in the apartments uh, where we lived, and we thought, why don't we knock on doors here? We, we did that in Siberia. <laughs> and, and we did. We just went to some neighbors and started talking to people about the gospel and actually got into conversations, got invited in. That can be kind of intimidating. There are a number of people who go door to door in the neighborhoods surrounding this church. If you want to know more about that, uh, talk to Vince Famusa. Find out um, when do you go out, what do you do, what do I say, can I just watch, can I follow you guys around, can I try? We've had people come to this church as a result of just telling people we're here, we're here to meet spiritual needs, can I talk to you about Christ right here in our neighborhood. Maybe you go dorm to dorm on a university campus. Maybe you host a dorm room Bible study. Uh, maybe you go to a foreign country someday and speak through translators. Uh, maybe you're involved in a college campus ministry. 
Uh, right now there's a group from our church going to the ASU campus on Mondays and just striking up conversations with people on campus. Uh, if you want to know more about that, come to the information table. They'd love to have you. Uh, there's some people that have just been having a great time doing that. You can be involved in a sports outreach, invite the neighborhood people to pick up games. I've done that with basketball and volleyball and uh, you give a gospel explanation uh, sort of at halftime of a game. I've done a college campus cookout event where I invited the best gospel speaker I knew, uh, handed out free hot dogs. Everybody come listen to this really great guy explain Christ. I've been involved in abortion clinic, sidewalk, prayer, evangelism, and counseling. I've done homeless evangelism, just walking the streets where there are homeless people and starting up conversations, sharing the gospel, uh, sometimes able to meet a need. Um, people are asking for things like, hey, I'm really hungry. Uh, I got into the habit in college in downtown Chicago with a lot of panhandlers. Uh, learned very quickly not to just give cash, but to say, hey, what do you need? Hey, I need a bus ticket. Great, I love buying bus tickets. Let's walk down to the bus station and, and buy it together. I'll walk with you and then I'll talk. Um, you, get, you get not as many takers on that one. Um, but hey, you, you're hungry. Great, McDonald's is right across the street. Uh, I'll buy you anything you want. Uh, let's sit down, sit down and eat a meal together and explain the gospel. Uh, those, are, those are good strategies. I've worked in uh, mission stations, downtown LA, downtown Nashville, uh, and in North Texas, uh, where uh, the homeless could get a meal if they would sit and listen to a gospel explanation. I've taken rounds with hospital chaplains doing similar things with uh, people in captive audiences. Um, USC Medical Center was a place where gunshot victims with no money, no, uh, no money and sometimes handcuffs on would be chained to a bed, uh, and you can go share the gospel with people there. I've shared the gospel in a deaf school in another country through double translation. <laughs> Nursing home preaching is another good captive audience, prison preaching, Juvenile detention preaching, um, nursing home visitation, all of those things are, are interesting opportunities where the, the people don't really have any place to go. Sometimes they'll listen, sometimes they're not allowed to go anywhere else. I've had a few opportunities to read through the Bible with somebody who is interested. Get into a gospel conversation, try to make the gospel clear, uh, you realize... I, the, the truths of substitutionary atonement, the, the realities of sin, the glories of heaven, they're, they're not hitting home. Someone's either too agreeable or they're dismissive, but they're willing to still talk. What do you do next? Uh, I, I have, I've had the privilege of inviting people, hey, would you be interested in reading the Bible? Uh, you read a chapter, I'll read a chapter, let's get together next week uh, over coffee and we'll just talk about it and working, uh, working their way through uh, a gospel, for instance. A great way to share the gospel is to explain your own testimony. In this church, we've had an interesting chain of evangelism when people have shared their testimonies at small group or in baptism. Others have heard those testimonies, been convicted of sin, turned their lives over to Christ, and then give their testimonies at a subsequent baptism service. That's encouraging. I get unique opportunities uh, as a pastor. I like to make the gospel clear when I preach sermons, communion meditations, obviously we like to focus on the gospel. When I preach a wedding or a funeral, I get opportunities to preach the gospel. In fact, that's one of the fundamental agreements. Hey, pastor, can you do our wedding? If I get to preach the gospel. Hey, will you speak at this memorial service? If I get to talk about Christ. I get invited to retreats and camps, uh, guest preaching opportunities in churches and conferences. I've been invited to Christian schools and chapels at Christian schools. I get invited to hospital rooms by believers and unbelievers, to visit with believers and unbelievers. 
A lot of times I'll have someone who's out of town who looks up the information on the church and calls me and says, hey, I have a cousin twice removed who lives in Apache Junction. Can you call him and share the gospel with him? Can you invite him to church? Well, that's a regular occurrence. Pastors have opportunities to speak and write, and it, it's normal that they would get invitations, and, and the expectation that they would talk about Jesus is the norm. It, it's like on your business card. It's what you're supposed to do. Uh, frankly, that, that sort of evangelism takes the fear out, right? It, because the expectation is this guy has a, a suit and a tie on and a Bible open, and he's supposed to talk about Jesus. I like being incognito. Frankly, I like it when people don't know I'm a pastor. I, I think the best evangelists are believers equipped with a thorough knowledge of the gospel who love their Savior, who scatter from this place and evangelize in all the nooks and crannies I could never get into. And, and to try to do some of that, I like it when people don't know I'm a pastor. I like to go into a coffee shop without a suit and tie and my Bible is sitting on the table. And, and having, by the way, a print Bible, this is not just an old school curmudgeon convic conviction, but having a print Bible out in public is something. Even if nobody talks to you, there's a Bible, oh yeah, a Bible. You don't know what that does in the heart of somebody who sees it. Everybody's got a phone and they scroll, you don't know what they're looking at. People don't know what you're, that you're neck deep in Bible when you're doing this. this is a, I'm not giving you biblical commands here. Don't throw away your phone. But I do want to press to you the advantage of having a print Bible in public. I love, I got something else to do. I got to be in a public place. Bring my Bible from the car and set it down. On an airplane, set my Bible out on a, on a tray. Um, I have had so many conversations started by other people because my Bible is out in a public place. I like that as a strategy. I would encourage you, um, be prepared with your own personal testimony. We do this in baptism services. Uh, maybe you've shared your testimony in small group. Let me encourage you to think thoroughly about the gospel of God's grace and your story and how when those two things hold hands, it's unique. If you just tell somebody your life story, a, a biography, doesn't get anybody saved. And sometimes when you just proclaim the facts of the gospel, it can be impersonal and abstract. But your life is actually a trophy of grace and a living testimony to the power of the gospel. It's actually a really good strategy to say, let me tell you what the gospel has done in my own life. I would encourage you to plan out, at some point, formally write out your testimony. And your testimony needs to include the facts of the gospel. It needs to include sort of the before and after picture of who you were without Christ and who you are now. Uh, but, but do that, plan to do that. And God saved you individually in all of your uniquenesses in the circumstances that he brought you to himself in order to use that as an emblem, as a trophy of his grace and the power of the gospel. Sometimes being a pastor gets in the way of evangelism. Uh, I, I liked being incognito uh, in the gym, pick up basketball games. And I could spend several months with the same group of guys, uh, we learn how each other play, we learn to trust each other, part of a team, and everybody's just talking and joking around, and you learn people, and they use all the colorful language that goes along with pickup basketball games. And then it happens. Somebody says, say, so what do you do? <clears throat> okay, awesome. You're a, you're a pastor? Hey, we got the Rev over here. And then nobody cusses anymore. Nobody tells the dirty jokes anymore. And while that makes a more pleasant basketball experience for me, now I'm out. And, and the difficulty with that is when people know that I'm a pastor, 
they talk different, they clean up their act as if it were my ears that were burning, right? I kind of want to ask them, does your mom know you talk that way? The Lord does. <laughs> the, the offense isn't primarily against me. You, you clean up your act because I'm the rev. That, that, that's, that's a problem. And then the problem with evangelism is they assume that when I have been talking to them about Jesus, and I've been doing so incognito, now they get it. Oh, that's your gig. It, 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 of course, you, you've got an angle. Look, it's not for me, dude, but I appreciate the hustle. It's like you're selling Cutco knives. Uh, you, you, you got your business and you got your angle. It's, it's your profession. Uh, no, I, I'm not talking to you about Jesus because it's my profession and I want more people in the church. I, I actually love pastoral ministry because Jesus saved me and I love him. And I'm telling you because eternal realities and you need Christ. But the cover's blown. I'm just going to say most of you don't have that disadvantage. <laughs> you can preach the gospel at your own wedding. You can preach the gospel with a wedding toast. You can preach the gospel uh, through your marriage vows. And then in a really interesting, visible way, you proclaim gospel realities in your marriage selfless, sacrificial love of a husband for his wife, devotion to the husband uh, by the wife as devotion unto the Lord. A watching world is to see Christian marriage as a visible representation of the spoken gospel. So proclaim the gospel and then live out its picture by God's design in marriage. You can preach the gospel at a memorial service. Um, you can have the gospel preached at your own memorial service. You can tell people what to say when you die. It's good to attend a memorial service and be prepared to talk to people about Christ. Ecclesiastes 7.2 says it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Why? Because the living take it to heart. If ever there's a place where a gathered group of people are thinking about eternal realities and their own mortality, it is at a memorial service. Be prepared when you go. You should go. You should go to as many of those as you can. It's better than a birthday party, says Solomon. And when you go, be prepared and be ready to speak the truth the gospel. Many of you are servants in Next Generation Ministries and you preach the gospel regularly in those classrooms. Thank you. Keep doing that. Vacation Bible schools, backyard Bible clubs, all of those are great ways to invite children in and make the gospel known. There are people in this church who are believers because adults made the gospel known to children who were not churched. It's fantastic evidence of God's grace. Another way to preach the gospel is to discipline your children. To discipline your children. Uh, we've got some great resources at the book table that connect your discipline of your children to their hearts and their eternal needs. Um, find parents who are a little bit farther ahead than you and ask them, how do you do that? And we can fall into, the, into a couple of mistakes on that connecting discipline uh, to gospelizing our kids. Um, if we assume that every time my kid disobeys, I must stop everything, preach a long sermon about obedience and disobedience, bring to them gospel realities, and plead for their repentance. Do you know what I'll do with that hour-long process? I'll say there's only 24 hours in a day and my kid has disobeyed 837 times. The math doesn't work. Sometimes you've got to take a, a bundle of offenses and address them that way. Pick your times, pick your places. One of the dangers is you'll neglect the gospel in your discipline or you'll reframe sin and you'll neglect your discipline because you've unfortunately burdened yourself with this great big gospel burden every time they sin. And then you'll start saying, well, that's not really sin because I don't have time to go through that hour-long process. Don't do either one of those. Don't neglect your kids in the connection between, hey, you sinned against mom and dad, but there's a bigger problem. Johnny, can I help you understand why it was hard to obey today? Did you have a hard time obeying mom today? 
Can we talk about that? Here, let's, let's look at our Bible at whatever level of Bible access they're at that's appropriate. Um, so um, I would just encourage you, use discipline as evangelism in the appropriate ways, not falling off cliffs, using resources, asking others who have done it well. Read the Bible to your grandchildren. You might be in a situation where you've got grandchildren that don't go to church because their moms and dads don't expose them to truth. What opportunities do you have there? Whatever you get. Uh, what, a, what a great way with the natural affection that grandkids have for their grandparents to put good gospel truths in front of them. You might be able to read the Bible to a friend or a loved one who is in end-of-life care. Somebody whose exit from this world is near and who may or may not know the gospel, who may or may not be conscious. You don't know what they can hear and not hear. Don't miss those opportunities. Use those opportunities. You can do evangelism as a taxi driver, an Uber driver. Omri did that for a while. That's a captive audience. Doors are locked, vehicles moving, conversations happening. Other side of that, you can ride in an Uber and share the gospel with your driver. That's a captive audience at least for a little while. Airplane evangelism, seatbelts, nobody's moving. Bus rides, train rides. Just watch whom God puts in your path in normal life situations. You may have school assignments where you are required to write things, maybe give presentations, maybe speeches. You might be on a debate team or an oratory team. Put truth in there. Use those opportunities. Whatever your family relationships are, children are a captive audience, parents, grandparents, siblings, all of these are great opportunities the Lord has put in your life to make the gospel known. There are many avenues I haven't tried. I've seen others do. Uh, military chaplaincies, first responder chaplaincies, sports chaplaincies, hospital chaplains. Uh, th those are sort of an occupational commitment to a group of people who live and work in traumatic situations who benefit from spiritual encouragement and gospel. Maybe you would start a neighborhood investigative Bible study. I've never done this. I've had friends who have done this pass out flyers. Hey, are you interested in spiritual things? Friday night at my house, coffee and cookies, uh, come and, and we'll just study the Bible together. I've had friends do that to great success. I won't be able to imitate my dad, but my dad was wonderful at bad joke evangelism. <laughs> He'd walk into a grocery store, he talk about an awkward situation, tell a really bad joke just to get a conversation started. And, and you know, there's a couple different kinds of bad jokes. There are the kind that are just absolutely bad on the surface. They're just a plain old bad joke. It's, there's nothing good about it. And then there's the kind that's a good joke, but has been told so many times that as a kid, you just roll your eyes and you go, Dad, come on, I've heard this a thousand times. But the grocery store clerk is hearing it for the first time. He laughs out loud. My dad's over there with a big grin on his face going, got him, and I'm going, oh, I'm so tired of this one. And all of a sudden, my dad's in a gospel conversation with the guy. How does he do that? <laughs> I don't know. It's a strategy that I have not been able to accomplish. Maybe you could translate the Bible into a language where the Bible is not known. Plant a church in another country. There's a lot of ways to do evangelism. You can invite someone to church. When someone comes to church, they are in one sense an outsider. They are an audience to the gathering of supernaturally transformed people. People from all backgrounds and walks of life unified together around a crucified Christ. And an outsider who comes in will likely hear the gospel. They'll, they'll hear it in what we sing. They'll hear it in a communion meditation. They'll hear it in the scriptures that are read. They'll hear it when a sermon is preached. They'll hear it in conversations. That's a great thing to invite somebody to church 
who's not a Christian, even though the church is for believers, what should they see? They should see Christian love. They should hear God's truth. They should witness a symphony of unified voices giving expression through songs of gratitude and worship to God, flowing out of hearts and transformed lives. In fact, unbelievers should come in and see what they utterly lack. Cleansed consciences, hope, joy, the vitality of real life, love. Here's a great encouragement for evangelism. Be the church. Be the church. Gather together, pray, sing loud, sing like you mean it, sit under God's word, grow, get equipped, be different, and get out into the world. That, by the way, is God's recipe for evangelism. Be drawn in, built up, and sent out. I think there are some things that have been reported as evangelism that don't count. Uh, I, I read somebody one time who said, you know, I like to share the gospel by smiling at people in traffic. I'm not sure that counts. Maybe you've heard the, the refrain, share the gospel always, sometimes use words. Um, no, the, the gospel always comes via proclamation, right? Um, there are tangible representations of it, like marriage, but without the proclamation of substitutionary atonement and the deep need of sin against a holy God that substitutionary atonement satisfies and the need for repentance and faith as a response to it, you haven't shared the gospel. So we need words. It's good to participate in evangelistic outings from time to time. If you've never done it before, uh, talk to the guys who are on the ASU campus. Uh, talk to the people going door to door in the neighborhood. Um, go with Ashley Anderson to the, to the retirement facility and engage with people who aren't going anywhere and can listen to the gospel. Um, go do one of those intentional evangelistic outings. But you need to know, big picture, your earthly stay is an evangelistic outing. That's the design by God for you of your time on this earth. There are other designs for your time here. But big picture, your time on this earth is an evangelistic outing. You're not at home. We're on a pilgrimage. I personally like variety. I think variety is the spice of life. I think variety in evangelism is helpful. If you happen to be a natural at relational evangelism, don't despise the street preacher. We're on the same team. Maybe you happen to be really good and practiced at cold turkey evangelism with strangers. Don't despise the one who's good at relationships and the long game. Don't despise the mom at home who's laboring to make the gospel known to little bundles of depravity. Spilling things, crying about stuff all the time. Here's what's great about the Lord's plan with the church. He supplies the church with a variety of gifts in varieties of people. And oftentimes evangelism is a team effort. It comes in combinations. Can people get saved by an unexpected cold turkey encounter on the street? Yes, I know people who have been saved that way. But be prepared to cultivate a relationship over time to involve the church. Some people are great at starting a conversation. Some people are great at explaining the gospel. Some people are great at fielding questions and objections. Some people's transformed lives and otherworldly kindness are compelling. Let's just put all these things together. We've got a few minutes to talk about some platforms for evangelism. So there's my long rambling list of different kinds of ways to do evangelism. Um, if you come up with 10 more, share them with me this week, I'll add them to the list. Let's talk, third point in our outline this morning, platforms for evangelism. And what I mean by platforms um, is just the, the thing on which your proclamation stands. And this becomes important for us. The, the gospel is not mere abstraction, but it comes through lives truly lived. And, and your life can be a hindrance to the gospel and create scandals for a good message. Bad people make a good message look bad. And your life can actually be a vehicle, a means God uses to make the gospel compelling. So let's talk about some platforms. Uh, first one is an obedient life. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. That's a, that's a remarkable statement. The, the Christian life is to be lived publicly. Good works are to be done in the audience of men, not for the approval of men, not to impress men, but as a consistent life testimony that is a platform for the gospel. 1 Peter 3 gives an interesting instruction to wives who live with unbelieving husbands or husbands who are disobedient to the word. How are they supposed to live according to 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2? Um, They are to live as godly women. And then even their um, potential complaints about the discomforts of living with a husband who is disobedient to the word. Uh, they are to live in such a way as to win him without a word. Okay? Now, that doesn't go against what we just said about the gospel itself has to come with actual proclamation. The without a word here is the, uh, I want to keep trying to change your behavior. <laughs> but live a godly life before an audience of disobedience to the word. And that is a means God uses to win people to himself. That principle, by the way, is not just for wives of ungodly husbands. But put yourself in any situation, uh, particularly one of authority structures, um, where you have to live in a way that is in keeping with a transformed life. There's a message there. Negatively, Romans 2 describes the Jews who had the oracles of God, who claimed that idolatry was bad and adultery was evil, and yet they were hypocrites, and they did these very things, both in the heart and outwardly. And God says about them that the name of God was blasphemed among the Gentiles because of their hypocrisy. So positively, live in such a way that the gospel has a platform, a compelling one. And negatively, when you are a hypocrite, the gospel looks bad. Let me give you a second platform, a separated life, a separated life. Turn to Acts chapter 5. You know what? We're going to stop there rather than rush this one. We'll come back to platforms next week and the theology of evangelism uh, when we regather, Lord willing, next week. We'll uh, close in prayer and then we'll be dismissed for about 15 minutes before main service. Lord, I pray that all of this discussion uh, would, would not be a, a big jumble of intimidation, but would actually be an encouragement that all of us walk out of this room, walk out of this building this week, eager to talk about our Savior, to talk about all you have done in, in redeeming us. We pray that we would live lives uh, that are excellent platforms for the gospel, that we would know the gospel thoroughly and clearly, and that we would just be ready at a moment's notice, at every opportunity to tell others about you. And we pray it in Christ's name, amen.